This morning I want to talk about the battle is the Lord's. I don't know what you might be going through or what you have gone through. But I do know one thing. That as the Lord lives, there will be victories. And as, a, as long as we're here on earth, there will be battles. Maybe you have not experienced one yet, but you haven't finished your course here yet. As Bishop King was saying last night as he brought the exhortation, it's a way of God preparing us. And he gave the illustration of the nut that was green and it couldn't be cracked. But when it was ripened and dried and ready, one smack and it's open. And these challenges prepare us. It ripens us. There's a story about a time in the nation of Israel. My text is taken from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning at verse 17. The nation of Israel was in distress. Armies were coming up that were overwhelming just to think of. They were coming up and King Jehoshaphat, he made the right, as they were approaching, the king chose to go before God and pray. The story in a little more detail this morning. Let's read it and see where it's going. Verse 17. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Jacob and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites and the children of the Korahites and of the children of, sorry, Kothanites and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning, and when they went into the wilderness to Tekoa, and they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord for his mercies endureth forever. Amen. Father, this morning we stand before you knowing absolutely convinced that you're an awesome God. You are supreme over all creation. Indeed, you have created all things. 
And sometimes we forget. Because of our humanness, we, we succumb to challenges and we feel defeated and depressed. And Lord, we ask this morning that you'll glean from your word truths that will encourage our hearts and lift us up. Lord, we thank you because you have done great things for us. And we stand in the midst of one of those great things that you have done. No man can take your praise for this work. Now we ask, Lord, that you'll fill this place with hungry souls that desire to learn of you and to know you with all their heart and soul and mind. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. And thanks for the offering, Lord. Give stewardship and wisdom over it. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the first truths that I gleaned out of this as I searched the passage was Jehoshaphat heard from God. When we are in distress and dilemma and we don't know which way to go, too often we turn to neighbors and friends and people in high places or educated and ask questions thinking that they have the answer for everything that we will need to be resolved. But there's only one who holds the answer for all things, and that's the one who created all things. He's our Jehovah Jireh, our great provider. He loves us with an everlasting love. The prophet Jeremiah tells us that. We need to turn to God in our times of distress and recognize that God knows everything and he has the answer for every situation and the solution for every impasse that we might face. I remember when we were on Cali's Hill, we had a challenge to put in a downstairs because I thought that we needed space so we can have fellowship times. And that was a challenge. Then we wanted to build an office because there was no office. There was just a screen that we went behind and I thought we needed an office space where people can come and receive counseling and have a private moment with the pastor. And we did it. And then I remember when we needed space because vehicles would be lined up the driveway and the community was getting a little upset with the, 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 the vehicles coming and the they, they, they felt that the, their community was being pinched on. I searched diligently and could not find a piece of real estate land that we could build so that we can accommodate a few vehicles as people come to church. An elderly man named Joseph you you. Uriah Moore called me and says, Pastor, I want you to help me. We have some land and we lost the papers in Hurricane Janet. And, you know, I don't know what to do. So I said, okay, we'll try and help you. And I took time off to work on it and took a while because the records were burnt out and all kinds of problems were happening. But as I prayed and looked to God for direction, he led me to a man in the system that knew all these things. And the government relied on him 
to outline all the land in this area because all the deeds and titles and what, what the majority were destroyed in some fire or something. And sure enough, when I got the land and titled, I was so happy for Brother Moore. We sat in the veranda and he said, Pastor, you buy this land. You work hard, you should buy this land. I've given it to you at a good price. I said, no. I have my own house. I don't need anything else. I'm not into business or real estate or anything. I'm a pastor of a church and that's my full-time function. But the church needs some land. And I said, that land would be perfect. Hallelujah, he said. And so we got the land. But we had no money to pay for the land. So as we bowed the knee and prayed, I remember we were trying to make some kind of arrangement for financing. We couldn't get financing. But we had to get it. And the solution was like in jo Jehoshaphat's days, going before God, and God's word was written. And as we prayed and the board came together and we discussed, we had things moving forward, we got a lawyer to represent the family and we got bingo. Hurricane Ivan came and smashed Grenada. How many of you remember Hurricane Ivan? Just a few. You're not here? It took me a day to get out of my house, and the next day I was in Calais to look at things because the members of Calais Pentecostal Church was my responsibility before God. And as I sat on the hill and I saw the devastation, I think Calais was hit the worst in the whole island of Grenada. All I could do was sit in my car and weep and weep. And God gave me a little plan. And we started to work. We gathered up all the fragments of houses and we started to rebuild. By Sunday morning, we had a tarpaulin covering the roof and we had church at our building. And then we made a plan of how we're going to rebuild. It was God's plan. And in the scorching sun, Brother Peter led that team and we rebuilt. I said we must rebuild his, his house first so he can leave his family in safety and then we could work on all the others. My own house was destroyed. No roof. But I had a place to stay. When it was all said and done and we settled with the insurance, you see, lots of people have faith to believe God for everything. But I believe God for everything, but also, wisdom tells me it's easier to believe God for an insurance premium than for rebuilding. So we had insurance. And when insurance settled with us, it was just enough to pay for the land. Isn't God great how he works? When you look to him, he will guide you. He has the solutions to the problems. I don't know what your problem might be. It's very different. But Jehoshaphat heard from God, and we need to hear from God. God knows the answer. And we need a word from God. It's written. All we need to do is read and pray and ask him to show us the, the direction, the way we must go. So Joseph had surrendered himself to God. In verse 18, 
And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. Many times we come to pray and we sit. Many times we come to pray and we want to talk to others while we're praying. But I think prayer is a time of total surrender to God. I remember when we came here and we started to work. We had days of prayer and fasting. And as I lay on my belly and my arms outstretched before God, I can actually see how things are unfolding. We are in the eschaton, the end time. We are in that period of time. If you haven't heard, there was a massive tornado that tore up several states of the United States of America. That front, vast, killing hundreds of people. Just yesterday and the day before, I'm not sure exactly when it started, but up to yesterday, there were people still in distress, waiting to see if the tornado will pass through their area. Hundreds of people left grieving over loved ones that passed away. A whole building of people making candles, just a heap of rubble with all the workers inside of it. Is it their tomb? Over a hundred plus workers? Have we ever heard of tornadoes at this time of the year? But did Messiah Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, did he not say that in these days there will be storms? There will be wars and rumors of wars? Have you not heard about the Russian situation with the Ukrainians? Have you not heard about China launching missiles, supersonic? Have you not heard about the new variant? And people are shaking in their boots because there's a Another wave coming. These are the signs or some of the signs that Jesus clearly laid out before us. If we would read his word, we will see his word because that is what Jehoshaphat worked on, the word of God. The prophet gave him a word because he didn't have a writing to read, but all the prophecies concerning Almighty God are closed, and we read them in his book. He gave it to us. So we will know the times that we live in. And that is why we needed the space that we sit in, because there's going to be a last harvest and if we don't prepare to receive the last harvest, if we don't believe there is going to be a last harvest, if we don't work to be part of the last harvest, Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send in laborers in the harvest. And we try to prepare our people to be laborers in the harvest. But God will send in laborers in the harvest if we are not willing to take the step. Just invite them to come and see. Let God do the rest. We have to surrender ourselves. The word of God must impact us. It must cause us to be motivated. But it also has to give us clear direction or we will fail. We will become fearful and frustrated. Fear and faith will never mix.
As soon as fear comes in, faith is shut out. If we are going to stand in faith, we're going to have to put away fear from our lives. Hello? But when Jehoshaphat spoke, listen to what happened, verse 21. And when the people had consulted with, sorry, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of his holiness. Say hallelujah to the king. We can praise God today. We have seen the glory of God. We have seen the hand of God in our favor. What will it take for us to be excited about God and what he's doing? What will it take? What more do we need? We need, when we hear from God, before we see the great results, we need to start rejoicing about what God will do because that's a demonstration of faith. That's a pronouncement of our confidence in Almighty God who's able to do all things, who has created and able to sustain all things and who loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son so that we would know how much we are loved that he took our sins and bore it on Calvary's cruel cross. And yet, in the midst of the pain and suffering, he's asking for forgiveness for those who drove the nails in his hands and his feet. Almighty God, how much do we need to know? What else do we need to hear? What do we need to see before we become excited, enthused, motivated, where we could start to praise God for his goodness and his mercy that endures forever and ever and ever. It will never fail us. We will never be disappointed when we serve our God with the enthusiasm that we need to serve him with. God will never get tired of the praises of his people. For those of you who attend our little Friday night studies, I want you to remember every Friday night, I try to get a testimony of what God has done for the week. Let me tell you, friends, if you are not alive in Christ, then something is not right because every one of us can should be able to testify of what God did from Friday to Friday or from Monday to Sunday. Every one of us should be able to testify of what God has done in our lives because that is worship. That is bringing glory. That is as good as singing the praises. We can lift our voice because a testimony comes only when we have been tested. We give God the glory for the victory over the test. That's a testimony. And I stand here today to tell you that no man could take glory for this building or any part of it. Because hadn't God not done it, there was no way we could have done it. Yes, we worked. Yes, we did our part. And that's how God loves it. He likes to partner with us did Jesus not tell us in Matthew 11? The last few verses of the chapter. Take my yoke upon you. Did he not tell us that? Yoke up with me. Come and join yourself to me. I am going to go with you. He will carry the load. The heavy loads, he will take them. 
the great burdens that are too heavy for us to carry, he can carry them. He already carried them to Calvary as a demonstration that he will never leave us nor forsake us, even to the end of the age. So as the storms rage, as the wars unfold, as all the, the, the end time unfolds before us, if we would focus on that one thing, the harvest, that has been our calling, the harvest, the harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. Before the clouds burst open and the, the Lord descends and the trumpet sounds, we need to get the souls into the kingdom of God. He's done everything he could and he'll continue to do it with us if we are only willing to give ourselves over to him. Jehoshaphat did exactly that. And he caused the people to rejoice and praise. He said, bring the singers. Bring the worship people. Bring them and let them sing and praise God as we go forward to face this mighty army. Instead of running from the army, we're facing them because we know we got a word from God. God said and that ends it for us. His mercies endure forever. Verse 20. So they arose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and you inhabitants. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. We need to encourage each other. Jehoshaphat knew that even at the last moment when they're ready to go, he needed to give a word of encouragement. And people, we need to encourage each other. It's in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 25. Or Hebrews 10, 25. I should look it up. I don't want to give you the wrong thing in case you make a notes. Yeah, Hebrew 10, 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching, the day of the Lord. Friends, the writer of Hebrews gives us a reminder of the responsibilities that we as the church of Jesus Christ, especially now in the end time, need to take hold of the same message comes from back in Jehoshaphat's day. People encourage each other. Faith is a positive lifestyle. Faith is not just talk. Faith is not just in your mind you believe. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, not yet seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, not yet seen. It is the strength that holds you in that place of belief and trust until it comes into reality. I was sharing with somebody the other day where the fishermen went out to fish 
and a member of this congregation was lost at sea. I think there were two of them, but one was from this congregation. Somehow the guy missed the bubble. They followed the bubble of the air coming up from the divers. And I don't know why they panicked or what they did. I don't have the details of it, but what I do know is when they called me, I spoke to his wife and I said, do not allow fear. We are going to pray for your husband and we are going to believe God, but we cannot be afraid. We cannot have any worry or doubt. We have to hold on to God with all that we have within us. And we prayed. Called a few other people to pray. In the morning, the boats went out very early. And our beloved brother Peter here was one of those men, and they went straight and picked the guys up just as if they were given direction, and they were given direction. They didn't have to make a circle to search. They went directly to where the guys were, picked them up out of the water. They soaked all night, and they brought them in. And when they got on the beach, they stepped out of the boat and collapsed right there. Why? Because our God is able. Church, we need to remember those things and have a positive lifestyle. Believing God is not a mental thing. It's a resolve in our hearts, our soul, our inner being. We believe in God for this with all that is within us. It's a substance. We cannot waver or change. Our first major attack was we were planning to sell our building on the hill to move in here. And the authorities that are over us would not let us sell the building. A decision was taken, but somehow they claim it wasn't recorded in the minutes. They would not let us sell the building. We didn't fight with them because our answer comes from God. I got sick as a dog. I had to go to Canada for surgery. And I came back and I'm laying on my couch. And the Lord tells me what to do. And we do it. And we opened up and had church. I could hardly walk. But Edmonton, West Edmonton Christian Assembly, who was a major part in this, organ in this enterprise, scheduled me to preach at the missions conference. They sent the tickets and everything else. I braced myself and I said, I'm going. I'm not going to disappoint them. When I got to Barbados, I just realized I couldn't take that flight. So I called home and I told the wife, I said, you know what? I'm going to take a first class ticket because we didn't have much money or anything else, but we did have a Canadian credit card. So I put it on the Canadian credit card. And I took a first class flight to Toronto. I couldn't take the strain. I made it to Edmonton by God's grace. I preached. I thought it was one service they were having, but the, they had too many people. They had two services. I preached both the services. And when I went home, I had my first real meal since I had my surgery. I couldn't eat. I had no appetite. I was weak. I just didn't desire food. I forced myself to eat. But the guy prepared a lovely salmon dinner, and I ate a full meal, and I was amazed at myself. I said, God, you're so good. We are called to trust God 
with all our heart and soul and being and love him in the same manner. As a matter of fact, we love him first. That's why we could trust him next. Not a head thing. Jehoshaphat, the king, is taking his whole army and all the nation with him who wanted to go to a massive army that could wipe them out. But he had a word from God and he knew that God will not change his word. He demonstrated the faith and he motivated his people. Let's go. I'm saying to you this morning, let's work together and fill this place up. Let's start reaching out to our neighbors, our friends, and whoever we meet in the road. There is a God. This is the end that's coming on us. There are many children born now, I believe with all my heart, that will not live to the fullness of their lives before the Jesus comes. I'm still believing in my heart that I will not die before he comes. Not that I'm afraid of death, but I prefer go with him. What a wonderful day it would be. But it would be a fearful and awesome day of fear and distress to the world around us. Because it will be doomsday for them. But it will be victory day for us. Will you give the Lord a hand this morning? Yes, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's a good God. We must have a positive lifestyle in everything we do, however we live it. We are going to make mistakes. Nobody makes as many mistakes as I do. I looked at my wife yesterday as she read over her little thing to me before we came here, and I said, with tears in my eyes, I said, I wish I could write like you. I wish I could do those things that you do. I'm so insignificant in these things. But you know what? She said, you have your strengths and your weaknesses. I have my strengths and my weaknesses. I said, thank you, honey. My wife of 57 years, what a wonderful encouragement she has been. And that's how we need to live, to encourage one another. Because it's a positive, active lifestyle. There's no dormant Christian. I had a friend in Canada, his name was Bernie Wright, but he did a lot of things wrong. I don't know how they call him Wright, and he was so wrong. He left his wife, a young lady working in his business. He told me he's a private Christian, wrong again. And I'm telling you, man, I just got saved and I was on fire. I just wanted everybody to know the wonderment of salvation. And to, to, to know that your sins are forgiven, it's unbelievably beautiful. And I can't turn back because the wonderment of it. And he tells me he's a private Christian that says, get out of here. There's no such thing as private Christian, boy. You ain't got it yet. But I've since then seen a lot of private Christians. They don't share their love with anybody or they don't share the, the little that they know. Every little piece I got, I was sharing it. And every morning I got up and I went in my office and prayed and God will give me a little piece of scripture as I read the word. And that was mine for the day. Wherever I went and people asked me questions, that seemed to fit perfectly. I shared it over and over, but not to the same person over and over. Different people as I went along. When was the last time you shared something that could bring somebody closer? Something that could challenge the way they think? We have to start to be active. They remember God's mercies. The shout I could imagine was, praise the Lord. 
His mercies endures forever. It takes them back to Adam and Eve when they sinned in the Garden of Eden. God didn't wipe them out. He pronounced salvation right there. He says, the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. And when the world become unspeakably wicked, he didn't wipe everybody out. He took Noah and he said, build this ark. Many lessons in the ark, the ark of safety. While they all scoffed and laughed, Noah kept working because he knew God's mercies was there with him all the way. Then when he went in, God shut the door because he's a merciful God. And he wiped out that whole world of people as a demonstration that God will not tolerate the lifestyles that are unacceptable forever. There is a day of doom, and there is a day of judgment, and there is a day when he will come and do what needs to be done, but we need to be sure that we're in the ark, that our names are written in the lion's, the Lamb's Book of Life. Are you, are you sure that your name is written? We need to be absolutely sure. And if we are, then there's no reason why we cannot share the mercies of God as a result. Because these people simply, they hadn't even seen the end of the army yet, but they're already declaring the mercies of God. They're already giving praise to God for all that he will do. What will it take for us? God's mercy is a result of his love for us. His love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son He gave. Do we give? Do we give a hoot about what happens to the souls that he gave his son for? Let me make a suggestion. If you don't already have a Bible, get one. And write some names of people you really want to see in glory with you on the front page. And every time you open that Bible, stop and pray for them. And when God speaks to your heart, you act on it. Don't cower away because he will give you the courage only when you step out. His mercy endures forever. I'll tell you a little story in closing. It's a little story I heard just recently. Jimmy was only 10 years old. And there's a large pond just outside of the house. They lived in a farm community. They'd go fishing there and other things. And he always wanted to swim across the pond, as most little boys want to do. They want to challenge themselves with something that they enjoy doing. And so he pleaded with his mom and pleaded with his mom, Mom, can I go? Can I go? It's hot. And she said, OK, Jimmy, you go. And on the way to the pond, he's stripping off his clothes and he dives in there in his birthday suit and away he goes, splashing away to the other side of the pond. But mom's washing the ditches and she sees a waffle in the corner, 
at the far end of the pond. And she drops everything and she wipes her hand in her apron as she's running and she's calling out to Jimmy as she sees the wake moving towards her son. Jimmy! Alligator! Alligator, come back! Jimmy hears a voice and he turns around. He starts to swim back. And she's waiting at the edge to grab him. But as she grabs him, the alligator grabs his feet. And as the alligators would do, they're trying to pull him in the deep, but mom's got his hands. She's holding on. The alligator makes it spins, and mom is grabbing hands and turning with the alligator until she got him straightened out again. And she's almost pulled the alligator out of the pond. But with the commotion and the screams, the farmer next door heard the word alligator, so he grabbed his rifle, came running, pow, kills the alligator. Jimmy's saved. His both feet badly damaged. So they rush him to the hospital. Doctors took care of everything, patched him all up. A couple of days later, the newspaper heard about all the incident and they come to do an interview. So as they're doing the interview, they said, I'd like to see your scars, your feet. So he moves or bandage a little bit so they could have a little look at one of them. And he pulls it back up. He said, but those scratches, the alligator did. But these, my mom, my mom did these. She won't let go. That's my mom. That's my mom. These are the main scratches. Forget about those. The marks of love. Today, we celebrate because there were lots Scratches from the opposition. I don't want to talk about them. They're very painful. It's what I want to talk about is those who God placed to hold on to us and carry us to this place. People like Erdo, West Edmonton, Phil Risco, the Marshall boys, the Carter boys, Joel Charles. And I can't name everybody because there were so many people holding on because God put you there to hang on so that we can make it. And whatever we face in life, he will be the one, his word will be the one that we must follow because he will hold on to us and he'll send the right people to the rescue if there need to be a rescue. Today we celebrate with God what God has done. Forget the many battles. At times they seemed unfair and impossible. At one time I called in a pastor because I wanted him to take over. I was too tired. I just couldn't go on. But God didn't allow it. The congregation didn't know it.
But God's word kept us. Remember this, whatever battles we face that seems impossible, hold on to the word of God. It will carry you through. So can we apply these lessons that King Jehoshaphat gave us? Can we apply them to ourselves today in any way? Maybe not yet, but maybe in time to come. I have a question. What do you think? Would you stand with me, please? Worship you.